Uh, you know, as, as we're working through a, a notebook on biblical interpretation, um, particularly special uh, principles that guide interpretation of every kind of biblical literature. And in a few sessions, we're going to deal with special procedures for certain kinds of biblical literature. So everything I've done up through tonight is going to be introduction, just to get your attention. Because I've got to, I've got to convince people that we're not doing it well for God's people to think about how they interpret the Bible and be willing and be willing to think through the issue again. I guess tonight, one of the things... <laughs> yeah, wait till you hear this. Um, I grew up at First Baptist Bel Air, went to school, East Texas Baptist College, went to Southwestern Baptist Seminary, pastored a church in this area as associate pastor, went to Lubbock, Texas. So most of my ministry has been in Texas. I began back in the 70s to start doing partnership evangelism. Done something over 30 of those, taking church members and students from the university with me when I taught there. And it has been a, a tremendous blessing for my life, not only for seeing people come to Christ, but for opening to my eyes to how parochial my theology was. Because I began to meet Christians around the world, Baptist Christians, who never thought about doing church the way I grew up doing it in Texas. And these are godly, wonderful, sincere uh, pastors, teachers, evangelists. And things that we are fighting over in Texas, things that American Christians struggle with, they, they just never had a fight over this. They never thought about it. Uh, too quickly before I get into my notes. Um, I remember Peggy and I were in uh, uh, Argentina. And uh, we, went, we were at a church of a well-known uh, South American evangelist. And we went to his house for lunch on one of the early days. I, I, I did, couldn't speak with him, but the translator was there. And the translator looked at me at lunch and said, uh, Brother Bob, uh, the pastor wants to know if you want red wine or white wine with your lunch. Do you have Diet Coke? <laughs> you know. I remember I was in Norway. Uh, I was 100 miles above the Arctic Circuit at a place where the really World War II started. And um, at the end of these services, things were really getting excited. And I told the pastor, I said, wow, really exciting things seem to be happening at the end of your service. He said, well, yes. He said, all the women deacons speak in tongues at the end. Man, they would kill you in Lubbock, Texas. I want you to know that. You just would not survive Lubbock, Texas. Now, this man is now the leader of all Norwegian Baptists. He is their director for all Baptists. That, that began to confirm to me uh, a thought that I've had that is a scary thought, and I'm going to try to convince you tonight of this scary thought, and that is we read the Bible only to back up what we already believe. We are not letting the Bible speak to us because we have a preconceived, a priori, theological, denominational, traditional agenda. And when we come to Scripture, it's like we only see what we're comfortable with, what we're used to, and what kind of, sort of, maybe could back up what our particular group does. Now, I've uh, characterized that as all of us wear glasses. All of us are theologically denominationally, historically conditioned, which means none of us are neutral readers. None of us come without an agenda to Scripture. And depending on where you were born and who you were born to and what church you grew up in, is the layers of filters through which you read the Bible. And these filters become more sacred than the Bible itself. And we will kill each other over the non-biblical filters and never even address Scripture. I was telling you this morning how I, um, I had to face this doctrine of landmarkism 
in Lubbock. Landmarkism is the view that Baptists are the only true religion, and therefore you have to be baptized by a Baptist pastor to really have baptism. Now, this is the trail of blood, if you know that. Um, it, this is all that closed communion stuff. That's a whole group. Thank God for them. They can reach people. But I personally do not think that that's, that's a reality. And, and yet, those are filters through which uh, many people read the Bible. So I, I told my pastors, uh, friends, and colleagues in East Tex I mean West Texas, I said, I am a servant of the Word of God. I have chosen to, to, to be under scriptural authority. If you can show me my error, I will repent and recant. And one of my uh, brothers said to me, turn to Deuteronomy. And I said, no, sir. I will not turn to Deuteronomy to discuss Christian baptism. I will not. Deuteronomy has nothing to do with Christian and nothing to do with baptism. Now what we do is take half of verses, oblique verses, redefine words based on English terms, allegorize texts that don't fit, ignore texts that don't fit, proof text small texts that fit, and twist texts that maybe could fit, and then beat our brother over the head with it. And that's true of every one of us because we're fallen human and we happen to be Christians. Now, if you look at my notes, beginning in Roman numeral one, these are the things that affect us, and they affect all of us. None of us are neutral Bible readers. Our personality type. Have you, I used to get, it, it just amazed me. You ask some people, what do you think? And they give you 13 books. You ask another and they go, oh, God loves you. Jesus loves you. May the Holy Spirit bless you. <laughs> Those people are going to think differently, I guarantee you. Personal worldview. I'm not talking here about basically systematic theologies maybe. I guarantee you Calvinists, Arminians look at the world differently. And they come to Scripture with everything in place behind them. They come, in, they come to Scripture with all the answers done and the proof text in place, and they never seem to hear the text, never. Personal experiences. It's amazing to me, the Christians I've met, something's happened to them, and suddenly they find that everywhere in the Bible. Everywhere. Spiritual gift. Place of birth. Do you, do you think that you believe the same thing as your grandparents did that were born in Texas, Baptist? Do you think that you believe the same as Baptists who live in Calcutta, India? If you do, you don't have to do any traveling. The place of your birth has stamped you. Now, we hold the Bible up and say this is the Word of God, and then we can't agree on anything it says and kill each other over little differences of this or that that we turn from molehills into Mount Everest and wonder why we have such conflict in Baptist life. The time of your birth, your parents and denominational training, and then personal sin it affects all of us. None of us, none of us come without a sinful heart. None of us come without preconditions. None of us come without, without a, a priori denominational indoctrination. Now, what bothers me, and I'm, I'm really, I'm really kind of nervous about this, is I'm about to kick you in the face. Now, you can assume that I'm doing it in Jesus' name because I love you, or you can take it as I'm trying to make you mad. I'm trying to drive a Mack truck through what you've always heard so that you be willing to rethink what you believe based on the Bible and not on where you happen to be born and who you happen to be born to and when you happen to be born. It's going to be uncomfortable for you and uncomfortable for me. Now, here's the deal I've made with you. I've told you I'm sinful. I've told you that I am conditioned. I've told you that I do not want you to agree with me. I want the freedom to tell you what I think, and I want to give you the freedom for you to reject it. Is that fair? That way I can speak with power, and you can say, well, I'll pray about it and go home and check your text. Now, really what I want you to do is go home and check my text. Think about what I'm saying. Now, if, if, we, can, if we can make that understanding, then I can do Roman numeral two. But my fear is that some of these things are so sensitive to 
20th century Texans, and most of you are 20th century folks. You just happen to survive it. But these are the issues that I've picked, and I've picked the most controversial that I have ever heard, and I'm trying to do that to make you think. Make you think, not make you agree with me. And I want you to look at me for a minute. I am not trying to change the way you do church. That is not my goal. You have the opportunity for someone to come who's a professor, lay some things before you, and go home that doesn't affect the way you think about your staff. Now, if you get mad at me, you're probably not going to leave. If a pastor did this, it would polarize people. I'm not in the business. I'm not a pastor. I don't try to keep everybody together. And get, I am a professor. I want to put the worms on the table. I can never get those stinking worms back in that jar. But I want to look at those worms because the worms is what's causing the undercurrent of division, dogmatism, and judgmentalness in our midst. And it doesn't matter if you agree with me. I do want to talk about the worms. You can see that I've done A through F in your notes. I've added about three more, two more, if I have time. And then this is just a one-page deal tonight. Um, next time I'll get into the method. Everything I've done so far is introduction. For those of you who are not able to, to be here, this is your first night. All of this is online at freebiblecommentary.org under Other Bible Study Aids. There's the video there. There's the audio there. This full notebook is there. And Peggy and I are in the process of putting the, the book I've just written that fits this, expands this. It'll be up in a week or two. So it's there. First is Christian music. Skylar, you want to leave the room? or <clears throat> I'm amazed that Baptists fight so much over this. And this, this is the issue that's dividing Southern Baptist churches today. This, this is the issue. This is the hot button. Most churches have had to go to two services to solve the problem. If you know the history of music in Baptist churches, if you go back, the Baptists began in the 1600s in England. Originally, they thought all music in church was a sin. Nobody could sing. Then they decided that one person could sing. Then they decided that the congregation could sing. Then they thought over what instrument. You've got to have a holy instrument. So it became an organ. Then the organ turned into a guitar and a piano. And now many churches have full orchestras. But every, music is a personal preference generational issue. It is not a biblical issue. Beat has nothing to do with God. Now, if you don't believe that, I hope you'll go to Africa and enjoy the richness of their worship services. Peggy and I go to South America a lot. They'll sing for 45 minutes before anybody speaks and love it. And we get here and go, well, I don't like that praise song. I'm changing churches. Holy spit! We will rip the people of God up over how we choose to worship him. Can you imagine what our Father must say to us when we get to heaven and say, boy, I stood up for those hymns. Hymns were new at one time. I remember the, the, the song leader at a church in Fort Worth told his pastor, if the author has not been dead 400 years, it's not worshipful. <laughs> well, there are other people I meet that say if it wasn't written this year, it's not worshipful. You have your personal preferences on music. Buy some CDs and put it in your car. Now, if this church can reach younger people with a different kind of music, it's a sin for us not to do it. But if we tear up the existing congregation to do it, it's a sin to tear up the congregation. How do you do it? I'm not sure I know, Skylar. I'm praying for you. This is the hot button issue today. There's got to be a way to do this in Jesus. Amen? Some people think if it has a certain beat, it's of evil. You know, I don't enjoy rap music. Well, it's not really rap. I, I was at a revival down the coast years ago, and one of the people in the church, son, was in a band, a Christian rock band, and I'm using rock with a capital R, called Spear, uh, Spur 54. I mean, they had guitars. I, I put earplugs in. It was unbelievable how loud that was. It's so, I'm so sorry our young people are so hard of hearing. <laughs> unbelievable. These guys were jumping and screaming and... And I want you to know the first 12 rows of this church were full of junior high 
and high school people to hear that band that I got to preach the gospel to who trusted Christ. <laughs> Bring that band in anywhere in the name of God. When I look at music, I look at the content. If the content is of God, the form is irrelevant. I judge preachers by the content. I judge singers by the content. I judge church leaders by the content of their lives and their statements. I like this beat better. Buy some CDs! Nobody put you on the Christian music committee, you big weenie. Nobody put you in charge of that. God didn't put you in charge of his church worship. How do you feel like you have the right to tear up the church of God over your musical preference? I'm going home tonight. Number B is mixed swimming. I used to call it mixed bathing, but <laughs> that's something else. You'll find out when you get married. It's, it's great. <laughs> mixed swimming is when girls and boys swim together. Now, you know, this is this radical stuff. I grew up in Houston. Do you think those of us who went to the coast often worried about the girls and the guys swimming together? Did the girls go to East, East Beach and the boys go to West Beach? No. Now, if the boys are wearing Speedos and the girls are wearing uh, thongs from Brazil, we got a problem. We got a problem. I'm not saying go crazy on this. It's the idea that if we don't swim together, we won't be sexually excited. Now, you've got to have an ostrich neck to believe that. The guys I know are sexually excited by breathing. <laughs> this doesn't solve the issue of human sexuality. There was a camp up in Oklahoma. Y'all know it's real famous. Where you can't hold hands on camp and the, and the girls and boys can't swim at the same time. So what we... <laughs> Y'all just keep smiling. Um, <laughs> what we do is we put 50 young people in a bus that holds 35. We drive them five days to a camp where they can't touch. <laughs> what is the matter with us? Number C is tobacco. Um, uh, it's kind of a generational thing. Uh, I, I, all the deacons in my church in Lubbock smoked. That was a flower bed, wouldn't grow nothing because of deacon butts out the front. <laughs> wouldn't grow nothing. It's becoming more of a medical issue, and the people who ought to carry this issue is the AMA. Smoke is not healthy. It's not good. We know that now. Um, my mother was addicted to smoke. She told me one time, if I can't smoke... It takes all the joy out of my life. My mother was addicted terribly. But my mother knew Jesus. She loved me. When I go to South America, smoking is the unpardonable sin for South American churches. They will not let you in an evangelical church if you smoke or use tobacco in any form. It's become the unpardonable sin. You can't be saved if you smoke. Now people say to me, and they say it here to me, well, your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit and smoking's bad for your body, so you shouldn't do it. All right, I agree with that. Then how come you don't exercise and diet? How come you eat three cheeseburgers in one day? How come your cholesterol's off the chart? Don't you be pointing your ugly, bony, judgmental finger towards somebody with an unhealthy aspect in their life and you're 50 pounds overweight! And you won't go to the doctor! and somebody touch your Baskin Robbins, you'll slap them to death. <laughs> but that's smoking, boy. What we do is pick out things we don't do to make ourselves look more spiritual. And it's a false, false spirituality. Now, all of us ought to be healthier. But I tell you what, I'm not sure I want to live that long when I see what, what really being older does to the body and mind. Now, the next one's just going to make you mad. I know it is. At the end, people say, well, I guess what you're saying is we can drink, smoke, and dance. Well, in some ways, I guess I am saying that. We've made alcohol the unpardonable sin in America. And we are far more influenced in our theology on alcohol by the temperance movement in America than we are the Bible. And I am not willing for Baptists to make themselves look better spiritually at the expense of Jesus, who's called a wine-bibber and a friend of sinners. So if the ultimate issue is to you that we use watered-down grape juice for the Lord's Supper, I think you have a theological, unbalanced mindset. 
Now you say, oh, you're into... I'm not advocating nothing. I am just trying to show you how so much that we've been given has little or nothing to do with the Bible and everything to do with your mother or your granddaddy or the preacher at your church where you grew up. We think we're biblical and we're cultural to the core. And we don't mind slapping anybody and everybody over our culturalness that we think is Scripture. They used to call Baptist pastors 40-gallon Baptists before the 1920s in America because they made their own wine at home. It is said that the evangelicals during that time knew the Bible didn't teach total abstinence but said that what alcoholism is causing in America needs to be dealt with. And I agree with that. The issue is addiction. The issue is abuse. Everybody says, well, if a few people do it, we probably ought to all quit. Then why don't we quit driving? Some of you are lousy, aggressive drivers. So should all of us quit driving because you, you break the rules? You say, well, there, maybe there's going to be an addiction in my family. Yes, there will be some people. We know now just the statistics are if one parent's an alcoholic... It's 25% chance higher than the kids will be. And if both parents are, it's 50%. Both of my parents are alcoholics. Smart says, Bob, don't go this way. Has nothing to do with the Bible. But I'm just sick of the super spiritual arrogance of evangelicals who look at their Methodist friends or Episcopal friends or Catholic friends and say, oh, look at that. Oh, but the, our own stinking self-righteousness and judgmentalism doesn't bother us a whit. What's the matter with us? Blinders. Evangelical blinders. Well, if you, didn't, if you didn't, hadn't been mad so far, go to number E. How many times have I heard this? Storehouse tithing is the will of God. Now, I'm afraid of staff members who do this. And they say to me, well, if we don't preach this, we can't pay the lights. Cut the lights off. God's people don't support God's church. Lock the doors. I'm so sick of hearing sermons in America based on Malachi that if you don't do it, God will get you. He'll take your money. He'll give you cancer. He'll get his money. Now, what kind of God is that? Or, hey, you tithe. God will make you a millionaire. So now it's greed or fear it's supposed to motivate my giving to Christ. You're not going to proof text Old Testament storehouse tithing that's for the Levite and the temple. If you let me proof text storehouse tithing, why don't I proof text killing animals on the altar down front? Or why don't you let me proof text the Levitical food laws? I ain't going to let you proof text one thing out of the Old Testament, then throw a guilt trip on everybody that's not even mentioned in the New Testament except Jesus talking to Pharisees twice. All of us are shocked there's no text on regular giving in the New Testament. The only text we have is 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, which basically is Paul's guidelines for the one-time gift for the Gentile churches for the mother church in Jerusalem. Regular, joyful, sacrificial. It's guidelines. But oh my. People pull Malachi on you, pull Leviticus on you, make you feel like a God hater. Or some of you have enough money that tithe means nothing to you. And there's some of you that don't have enough money to buy food tomorrow. And I guarantee our God doesn't have a calculator. Is it the gross or the net anyway? So if you don't tithe, God will give your children polio. Is that the deal? If you do, God will protect your kids from a wreck. Is that the motivation we have for Christian giving? This self-centered, what's in it for me, American Christianity? God have mercy on us, and we fall for this manipulation because we don't know our Bible will have to defend ourselves. Interracial marriage. God have mercy on us. Interracial marriage is not a biblical issue. But in the South, it's become a biblical issue because we're racist. I had a deacon tell me in my first church, 
when I told him I was going to the black homes in my community. He said, now, Bob, you're right. God will save black people, but he'll wash them white as snow. You're right, Bob. Philip went down and spoke to the Ethiopian eunuch, but he sent him home to his own church and didn't invite him back to his church. This is the racism you and I grow up with. We project that now and out into the world. I submit to you that Numbers chapter 12 says that Moses married a black woman. And if you want to pull the quotes from Ezra Nehemiah, it has nothing to do with race. It has to do with Jews versus Canaanites. It's a religious issue, not a race issue. And if you go to Leviticus about mixing seeds or mixing threads, you don't know how the breeds of animals have developed. Horses, cows, dogs, chickens, they're all, they're all breeding different animals to get different varieties. The problem is that the Bible is a non-racial book. God does not see color. And we use it as a weapon in the South. A couple more you don't have I'd like to talk about briefly. Number G, if you want to write it in, is baptismal time, method, administrator, or formula. When do you do it? How do you do it? What formula do you use? And who does it? Now, the same thing is true of the Lord's Supper. You get so much dogmatism in this area. I would say there's far more biblical evidence for doing the Lord's Supper every Sunday than it is once a quarter. Where did we get that? The book of Hezekiah. There's, that's tradition. Tradition is not bad or good. Just, just know it's tradition, not Bible. And it just kills me when one person will say, well, you were baptized in Jesus' name, and you're baptized in the Trinity, so you can't be saved when they're both in the Bible. The Great Commission is the Trinitarian formula. Acts is the Jesus' name formula. So you're going to send everybody to hell on a Matthew formula, or, a, or it's the same thing in Acts, but with a different name. Can you believe that people do that? And yes, they do, because their mindset is this. The Bible says it, that settles it, and it says right here this, so that's why. But they never even read the rest of the Bible. How about uh, my last one, number H, and then I'm going to move on. And I'm going home. I really don't want to talk to any of you. Number H, how one celebrates Christmas or Halloween or other uh, cultural holidays. I've had church members who say, we don't put a Christmas tree up in our house. I understand that. Fine. God bless you. I understand that. That evergreen is, has pagan roots in Europe. There's no doubt about that. There's no doubt about that. There's no doubt that, that uh, December 25th probably has some pagan associations. We're not 100% sure Jesus was born on that exact date. I understand that. And you have a right to do that in your family. What you don't have a right is to tear up my church because we have a Christmas tree on the side in the auditorium. You have the right to believe that and manage your life by it. You do not have the right to project your views on every other Christian who ever lived. I used to use Halloween as a witnessing tool. I am a Great Commission Christian, and I'm a clever person. We used to go get dead flowers from the cemetery, put, dress up all the staff in weird clothes, get every Sunday school department to build a little village, invite the whole city, give them safe candy and gospel tracts. Now, some people say, we don't, we don't believe in Halloween. I understand that. I understand that. I do, I do. But are you going to stop the church from doing an evangelistic effort for the city because you don't believe in Halloween? See, it's that I get to vote because I'm an American. See, it's that individualism that's the killer. My view, I, I give money here, I'll tell them what I think. Friends, I guarantee you, before you say anything to God's people, you better have prayed about it first, and you better follow the will of Jesus and the life of Jesus when you say it. You don't have the right to tear up God's church over your personal preference and opinion. You have the right to live your life. You just can't put your bony finger on others who don't happen to agree with you, particularly in non-scriptural issues. What must be done? If we identify our biases, you mean we have biases? Is there some in here who are racist? Is there some in here that are sexist? Is there some in here that are anti-Semitic? Are there some in here committed to a particular theological system? 
Are there some in here who've been indoctrinated by denominations so strong that they can't see anything but their own traditions? You bet your bippy they're in here. They're in every church. Somebody said, I'm going to go find a, a, a good church. You find a good church and you join it, you'll screw it up. Ain't no good churches. Just churches full of sinners saved by grace, struggling to do the will of God. But you're not the standard. Jesus is the standard. We must identify our biases. So painful. We must. We all have them. We must identify them. Second, we must personally discern the irreducible minimums of the Christian faith. I usually put it in this way. A professor at Southwestern, Bill Hendricks, one time asked me, he said, uh, what is the least that one can believe and be a Christian? Well, I thought about that. I said, well, what? He said, I'm not going to tell you. You go home and think about it. Well, I came back with about five things, mostly about God, the Bible, and the person and work of Christ. And he said, well, Bob, I'm glad you don't have 30 things. He said, Bob, if you will preach the irreducible minimums and discuss the peripheral issues in love, you'll have a successful ministry. I like the, uh, the motto of the Evangelical Presbyterian Church that got it from one of the church fathers, and I don't, I don't know where they got it offhand. In essentials, unity. In peripherals, freedom. In all things, love. I like that very much. So what is the least that someone can believe? Just, just a real quick to show you how we've done this. Some people quote um, Acts 2.38 and say you've got to believe, repent, and be baptized. Some say go into the, the, the salvation experience of the Samaritans where they trust Christ with Philip but John and Peter come back and preach again, and they all speak in tongues. And suddenly now speaking in tongues is necessary for salvation. Now, Baptists usually go to Acts 16, the uh, Philippian jailer. What must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we even, that, that didn't even have repentance in it. They're baptized that night, but it doesn't have repentance. Uh, we can't, you can't proof text those things. I, I would ask you this, to go through the book of Acts and write down every time someone is saved and put what happened when, and you will find there's no standard model. Luke records what happened, not what should happen. You can't let the Church of Christ or the Charismatics or the Baptists pull one example out of Acts and make it the pattern for all Christians. And this, this is true of so much. What is the least that someone can believe? I hope you'll think about that. It's not an, it's not an easy question. Not the most for maturity. What's the least that de marks you off from an unbeliever to a believer? What is the least? I think we must decide. Put it another way. What doctrines will I die for? Will I die for the how we take the Lord's Supper and when? Will I die for how we baptize backwards, forwards, three times, running water, what formula? Will I die for what millennial position? Uh, will I die for what translation? No, I will not die for those things. Will I die for the deity of Christ? Yes. Justification by grace through faith? Yes. The trustworthiness of Scripture? Yes. The goodness and eternality of God? Yes. These I'll die for. But I will not die, for we don't spit, dance, or chew, or go with those who do. I will not die for those things. You've got to kind of decide what's worth, what's worth making the stand cling to these major truths of historical Christianity. There ought to be a core, no matter what culture, no matter what century, there ought to be a core, going back to the New Testament, of the common ground between all Christians that Christians can affirm. I would submit to you, these are the things I talk to you about. The character of God, the trustworthiness of Scripture, the person and work of Christ, how someone is saved. These are the these are the common core that we must cling to and go back to again and again. We could disagree over the common core. I understand that, and it's going to happen, but that's where we, we've got to go back. Number D, maturity will make one less dogmatic and judgmental. I usually put it this way. The more you read, the more you know, the more you try to interpret the Bible, the more you know you don't know. The more you see how you've been... Uh, you've been um, tricked or confused by literalistic, proof-texting, small portions of, of the Bible. The more you see that, the more you realize that many things that you were taught are bad or evil or somehow not godly are not bad or evil or ungodly at all. Not at all. Not at all. And yet...
the responsibility of the interpreter. Now, Baptists are real big about quoting the priesthood of the believer. May I say to you that the word, the phrase, the priesthood of the believer never occurs in the Bible one time? I hope I got your attention. The phrase, the priesthood of the believer, never occurs in the Bible, not once. Now, what does occur in the Bible is the priesthood of believers, plural. But we've taken that phrase and used it for individual, personal freedom to believe what I want to, interpret what I want to. Um, I've got a right to interpret the Bible. Yes, you certainly do have a right to interpret the Bible. We as Baptists have always clung to the logical, the logical point that for, to have a moral responsibility, we must have the freedom to choose and are responsible for our choices. It's called soul competency. I only can respond to God in what I understand he's saying to me. I've got to read the Bible for myself. There is no priest between me and God. That's the ideal of soul competency. I certainly, as a Baptist, believe that. But the priesthood of believers used in Exodus 19 and quoted for the church in 1 Peter 2 and Revelation 1 is basically an evangelical great commission about us going into all the world and making disciples. It has nothing to do with personal freedom. I would say to you that what has happened, we are children of 20th century, 21st century America. And our lives, because of the culture we have grown up in, is skewed toward personal freedoms, the rights of the individual. Now, in many ways, I think there's, there's good in that. Ezekiel 18 is a very individual-focused Old Testament text. We come to Christ, as many as receive him, John 1, 12. Whosoever believeth in him, those are individual texts. But the Bible as a whole is, a Western, is an Eastern book, and it's a corporate book. And we've got to realize that in America, we've got to spare no effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, Ephesians 4. That we must, spare, we must use all of our energy and all of our self-restraint and all of our wisdom for the growth and health of the body not individual preference, individual opinion, individual whatever. Yes, you're responsible for what you believe and you'll stand before God for what you believe and how you've lived it. But while we're here, our arms must go around the group. We live for the whole. Think of the metaphors, the body of Christ, the building with living stones, the field with different planters. It's always corporate. We are in this thing together. And if we're not careful, we get into America and I get to vote, I get to express my opinion. And when we do, we skew, we skew the Bible. Now people often say to me, well, I'm, I just take the Bible for what it says. You do not. I'm sorry, you do not. Not one of you have a cut off arm or a poked out eye because you took the Bible literally. If your eye offends you, pluck it out, and if your arm offends you, cut it off. Now, I know some of you, it just, I know you ought to have a cut-off arm. And some of you should be blind tonight. No, you don't take it literally until it suits your personal preference to take it literally. The Bible demands interpretation. And all I'm saying to you, the place to interpret it is not like the morning newspaper based on your personal preferences. The place to interpret it is on the original author's intent and understanding what the first hearers would have understood and then apply that truth to our day with the same power. The Spirit is crucial in interpretation. Later on in the seminar, I will deal with the Holy Spirit's role in interpretation. We cannot interpret the Bible without Him. The problem comes when we have godly people, trained people, prayerful people, sincere people, people seeking the mind and heart of God that radically disagree on the Bible. I do not know why that happens. And I will talk about that when I come to the Holy Spirit. But I want to say here that the Spirit is absolutely crucial. You do not bring your IQ to the Bible. You do not bring your theological training to the Bible. You bring your prayerful need and a request for the Spirit of God to open the mind of God for you. And I will talk about that again. The text I often use is 1 Corinthians 2, 10 through 13. I hope you'll check that. 
D, we must walk in the life we have. Now, this light that we have is going to be affected by, I've kind of made a little list here. It's not in your notes. You may want to add it. You walk in the light we have, the level of our Bible knowledge, our denominational or family traditions, and cultural conditioning is some of the light we walk in. And when we stand before God, there's going to be different kind of Christians. One Christian would say, Lord, I never in my life let alcohol pass my lips. I never, Lord, smoked a cigarette. I never went to a bar. I never danced. Lord. And when God looks into the heart of that person, and the person's heart is pure, and they were trying to do the will of God, and they understood these texts in that way, he will say to them, well done, good and faithful servant. But here's another Christian, and he has not seen it that way. And all the things that that person thought were evil, this person does in open-eyed freedom of his place in Jesus Christ. And God looks into that person's heart. And he wasn't trying to trick people or manipulate people or, 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 or tear things up. And he's going to say to a Christian who looks very much different from this one, well done, good and faithful servant. Um, I've met people. I met a man in Orange, Texas who told me that it was kind of an uneducated person, lived out in the woods. He said his parents told him that if he ever cut himself with an ax, that if he would quote that text in Ezekiel about, I found you squirming in your blood, which has to do with Israel as a child, a metaphor for God birthing her, that if he would quote that verse, that the blood would stop. Now that man believed that. That's crazy to me, crazy. That man sincerely believed that. That man will stand before God with his belief structure and God will honor him if he has done it with the right motive. Now, if I stood before God with that, he would laugh at me. Because, see, you're not responsible for my truth or my light and I'm not responsible for yours. So quit trying to project yours on me or anybody else. I can't tell you the thing that hurts my feelings worse in these kind of meetings when somebody comes up to me, sincere people, and says, well, Bob... We just really believe if you would pray more and read these books, you'd agree with us. Don't you hear the arrogance of that position? Please don't tell me that. I'll, I'll fume all the way home, and Peggy doesn't need that. Always open to more light from the Bible and the Spirit. And I've mentioned Romans 1.17, Romans 14.23. We will be judged only in relationship to our understanding and how we've lived out our understanding. Number E, I hope you'll list and analyze your own presuppositions. And if you say to me, well, I don't have any, there's one. <laughs> now, brothers and sisters, I have purposely tried to muddy the water of your theology tonight. Now, you've got to judge my motives why am I doing this? Am I doing this to get you to agree with me? Am I doing this to have any control over you? Am I doing this to change the way you worship? Am I doing this to get you to join another denomination? I'm not. Pray God, I'm not. I hope, I hope my heart is open enough to you that you know that's not my agenda. But my agenda for you is that you become a competent self-feeder on the Word of God that you allow Scripture to be the only source for faith and practice, that you really do not take what somebody says from a pulpit or from the television or from some popular book until you check the Scriptures and see if you think the Bible really teaches that in context. That is all I'm asking. May we pray? Lord, I don't enjoy doing this. I don't enjoy doing this. And yet it seems like you've given me this as a task for me in this time. Please protect gentle, sincere, uninformed believers. Protect them. Help them not hear anything I've said. Oh, Lord, protect new believers. Protect those who struggle. But God, if you have spoken to me, if there's any truth in this, I pray you would loose the Holy Spirit on these believers that what they say about your word would really be how they handle it. And I pray you would deliver us from this cultural, theological conditioning that makes us ugly to other Christians that, for whom you died. 
God, forgive us when we think that we're closer to you than others. God, forgive us when we think where and how we grew up is somehow superior to Christians in other cultures who never would agree with us in how we do it. God, forgive us for being so comfortable in what we believe that we're not willing to look. Well, Lord, I know I'll fuss it to myself all the way home of what I forgot to say or should have said, but in reality, your spirit's the key here. I pray you would free us from denominational traditions, judgmentalism, dogmatism, and help us to be more like Christ. I thank you for our differences. In this room, I know there are differences. I thank you that our differences can reach different people in the world. Forgive us for trying to make everybody just like us or making ourselves the standard by which all should be judged. Help us be the Great Commission people of God to bring human beings whom you died for home. And if our theology is standing in the way of that, I pray you'd convict us. And if our theology is a bridge to reach certain groups, I pray you would accentuate it. We love you. We trust you. We do not trust ourselves. We do not trust our culture. We do not trust what we've been told. But we do trust your book. We do trust your son. And we pray for the presence and power of your spirit to help us walk in a way that's pleasing to you in the midst of our differences. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. I hope you will think about these things, pray about these things, and check the Bible about these things. Good night.